My name is Sean, and I'm an alcoholic. So, uh, my sobriety date is August 3rd, 2016. Um, I have a sponsor through the steps to take other guys through the steps. My home group is in South Haven, Mississippi, which is just south of Memphis. Uh, it's every Sunday, Tuesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. It's a young people's meeting. So if you're ever in Memphis for any reason, uh, you know, if anyone travels to Memphis, definitely get my number. I, I rotate a lot of meetings. The recovery there is really good. You know, I love Memphis AA. I'm excited to come out here and see what you guys, you know, do out here. Um, I'll start my story from the beginning. Uh, my mom got sober. Her sobriety date was the night that I was conceived, apparently. You know, she told me that, and I don't know why, but uh, she was brand new sober when I was born, and uh, she was very involved in AA, and uh, she had a lot of early recovery issues. You know, she was a single mom of two. My brother lived overseas for a while. He came in later, but, uh, you know, she didn't have a lot of money, single parent, working nights. And uh, I mentioned that, and I don't think this made me an alcoholic, but it definitely contributes to some of my isms. You know, I, I wasn't socialized a lot, we moved around a lot when we were poor, you know, lived in garage apartments, whatever, you know, stayed with babysitters quite a bit. And, uh, you know, she was doing her best, and, you know, eventually I started, you know, seeing how different I was from other kids. And uh, I, I felt different from the very beginning. And when I came to the rooms and I started hearing other people talk about how they just always felt separate from everybody else. Like that was the first time that I'd ever heard that verbalized. And uh, it was very relieving to know that I wasn't the only one that felt that way. And, uh, you know, we moved around a lot, but we finally moved to one place and stayed in one place when I went to kindergarten. So uh, I go to kindergarten, and all these kids, they've already made friends from like the neighborhood or preschool, whatever it is, and I'm the new kid. And uh, it seemed like everyone else just knew how to be a person, and I did not. You know, I didn't get to watch cable television. I didn't know what they were talking about. I didn't get the toys that they had, whatever. You know, it's not a pity party, but, you know, this is just how I felt as a child. And, uh, you know, I did make some friends. And it's funny that like most of those friends that I made, even as a six-year-old, turned out to be alcoholics. Now I don't know if that's a coincidence or if you know my brain was just warped from a very early age and I sought out other warped people. You know, I, I tend to attract what I am. And, uh, you know, we had a little ragtag band of individuals. We were all outcasts, but you know, we stuck together. And uh, we got bullied, you know, until about middle school. And in middle school, I grew up taller uh, than a lot of the other kids faster. You know, I just hit my growth spurt early. And I started to learn that, like, I'm not going to get bullied if I am the aggressor. You know, so I learned a very effective defense was being offensive. And uh, it was one of my first really unhealthy coping mechanisms. And, uh, it did a lot of things for me. You know, it, it's so strange that, you know, I start being mean to people and picking on people, and then I get a girlfriend, you know, and that really started to serve me. And I'm like, this really works, and I've really integrated this into my personality, and I still struggle with it today. But, uh, you know, and then it turned into video games and food, and I was super overweight, and uh, I was just obsessive about anything that I did. I remember, you know, I guess I'm not that old, but Halo came out on Xbox, and I skipped several days of school, and, uh, you know, it was starting to make my life a man I'd get out of school, and I would just play this video game for six hours, and then it turned into uh, my friends and I going to Starbucks, and they still have them, but they're these little canned double shots, and we would just pound ten of these little double shots just to feel something. And uh, I remember sweating, like lying in bed for two days, unable to sleep, you know, just pure caffeine, like overload and withdrawal. It was awful. But it was exciting, you know. And uh, my mom was heavy in AA. My brother had come to live with us, and he was more of the uh, 
the bad kid. I mean, we were both doing things we shouldn't be doing, but he got a lot of the the attention, and I kind of slid under the radar. You know, he would smoke weed or drink and get caught doing all this stuff. And you know, to that point, I still thought people that did that stuff were stupid. You know, like you know, I grew up in the rooms. You know, some of my first memories were in AA meetings. So you know, that wasn't cool. Anything my brother liked, I hated. So you know, I didn't really mess with anything. And um, my mom eventually got sick. Uh, she had congestive heart failure and uh, pancreatitis from her years of drinking, and she stopped working. And that's relevant later, but, uh, you know, I went through high school just being this mean kid, you know, picking on people. I had my little group of friends, and we were cool together. But, uh, you know, eventually, at the end of my senior year, a friend of mine came over, and he had a bottle of liquor. And I was like, you know, you got to try it sometime. You know, I'm not going to go my whole life without drinking. So, you know, of course, I'd never drank before. And he pulls out this bottle, and it is Everclear. Oh. And I've seen all these movies and all these cool people, you know, these women, they'll, like, get a shot of whiskey or something. They'll slam it. They won't make a face. Slam the glass on the table, whatever. So I'm this bully, tough kid, whatever, and he pours me a shot. And when I drink it, it feels like I'm drinking molten lava. And it is just like burning me alive. As soon as it touches my tongue and I can feel it into my stomach and I can feel that throughout my whole body. Yeah. But uh, of course I had to play it cool. You know, I had to act like it wasn't a big deal. You know, it's just, just a little drink, you know? So I had several more and I was violently ill. You know, I did not enjoy it. And I remember, you know, throwing up and then I passed out. I had to go to school the next morning. I woke up and I was still drunk. And uh, I had to drive myself to school. So the very first time I drank, I also drove. And uh, I remember sitting in my first class, which I was a band kid. You know, so my first class was band. And I uh, played trombone. So I had this deep alcohol breath and I'm blowing into this horn, you know, and everyone around me is just like looking around and it felt like pretty cool, you know, to be the bad kid, you know, the one that's like secretly drunk at school. So, uh, you know, that week went by, I didn't really think much about it. And then that next weekend, uh, he brought over a bottle of whiskey and I had a much more moderate experience and that's when I understood you know, I had been this angry kid, you know, I would lash out at everyone, you know, even my friends I was mean to, but like in a, a sort of joking way at least, I could at least maintain a small group of friends. But the feeling that I got was so comforting, you know, and all that fear that I'd always grown up with that like I wasn't good enough or I wasn't going to fit in or people would find out who I really was and they wouldn't like me and I couldn't tolerate that. And uh, all of that seemed to go away, you know? And uh, from that moment forward, I used something every day. And I'm not going to talk at length about anything else. This is AA. I do go to another fellowship. But, you know, I, I classify all this stuff together. You know, I can't use anything successfully. I will obsess over anything. <coughs> and uh, that's my experience. So... <coughs> I uh, am now really understanding why people did this. And uh, anyone around you, I called it my medicine. And anyone that knew me would agree. You know, because finally I could be cordial. I, I could be comfortable. I could talk to people in a friendly manner. I mean, and even my mom. After she realized I had a problem, like she still had a hard time discouraging me because I was so much easier to get along with. You know, I was rarely this angry drunk. You know, I was more or less, I mean, that's how, when I tell people around me, like, if I relapse, you'll know. Because I'll, I'll just be the nicest guy you've ever met and I'll be so out of character. You know, you'll know. And, uh, you know, I, I went to college and I immediately sought out you know, other kids that were focused on partying, and uh, that's what I did. I was not very focused on going to class, you know, so I only made it through one year of school, 
and uh, I eventually moved back in with my mom. And at this point, she had been really sick for a long time. And I, I will mention this, it's not necessarily part of my story, but her being so sick and me being this newfound hippie, I was like, you know what the cure-all medicine is? Oh, yeah. You know, it fixes everything. You know, it cures cancer, whatever, brain tumor, who cares? You know, try this. And she had been out of meetings for probably eight years at this time. She had been really depressed, bedridden most of the time, and uh, she finally gave in. And I strongly encouraged my mom to relapse. And uh, she relapsed after 21 years. And uh, things got really different. You know, I didn't necessarily know what type of beast I was awakening. But uh, it got really bad. They eventually lost their house, their all their retirement. You know, they have since gotten sober again. But, you know, things got way different. You know, after growing up in meetings and seeing her sober my whole life to see her blacking out and falling over and all this other stuff, you know, it was just really wild. And, uh, you know, my life was getting out of control. I, one of my angry nights, you know, I don't have a lot of them, but when I have them, I really have them. Uh, I woke my mom up and I threatened to stab her. I had a knife and uh, there's a lot more behind that, but it's not really necessary to, to tell it all. But that was my first experience with jail. And I remember I was so messed up, you know, because I had, had the knife and then I had turned it on myself and I still have scars on my wrist because I had like cut myself. And I, I woke up in isolation on suicide watch. And I remember, and if I curse, I, I'm trying to wash my mouth a little bit, but I, I'm sure I'm gonna let a couple slip. Apologies in advance. But uh, I wake up and I'm in this holding cell and I'm still so messed up. I, I just lift my head up a little bit. It's like, wow, this is the worst fucking dream that I've ever had, you know? And then I lay back down and I wake up however long later and I'm still in jail. And that's when it really hits me, you know? So uh, I ended up staying in jail for about a month and a half. And then I went to my first treatment center when I was 21. I went to Whitfield in Jackson, Mississippi, or really Rankin County, but it's a state facility. It's not very nice. It's definitely not one of those country club places. And from the very beginning, you know, I told them, you know, I'm here to get this court stuff off of me. You know, I, I'm not going to stay sober when I leave here. I'm going to slow down. I'm not going to go crazy. You know, I'm 21, just having fun, no big deal. And, uh, you know, as soon as I left that first night, I am torn all the way up again. All the way up. And, uh, you know, I, I spent a little bit of time back in South Haven, and my life just kept falling apart, and I was starting to do things that I was, like, really, like, ashamed of, like, stuff that I normally wouldn't do, you know? Or at least I, I thought I normally wouldn't do stuff like that, but, you know, I'm, like, hitting on my friend's girlfriend. And uh, I'm getting verbally and emotionally abusive with my girlfriend and, you know, all this other stuff. And uh, eventually, me and the girl break up and my brother got a job opportunity in Austin, Texas. So I figure, you know, just being in this environment is the problem. You know, I've got all these, you know, friends, all they do is party. You know, I don't know anything else. Let me go to Austin, you know. And he and I went. And it seemingly did get better for a short period of time. Seemingly, you know, but you know, over any considerable period of time, it gets worse, never better. So I'm sitting in Austin for a while, and of course I'm still drinking every day. And uh, you know, I'm just doing it at the house alone. And my brother's not really enjoying the situation. He and I get into a big fight, and he decides to move back. And uh, what I was doing was uh, storm restoration, like construction work, residential stuff. And uh, there was a big storm that had just come through Dallas. So I went from Austin to Dallas. And I found a company to work for that was owned by a guy that was much like me. And, uh, you know, he kind of helped me out with the place to stay, you know, I, I wasn't making a ton of money, the money I did make, I was drinking and all that other stuff, and, uh, you know, we would drink in his garage, and this guy really had the, the stuff, he had a really nice camper, he had a really nice house, a boat, truck, 
that kind of stuff, but he drank like I drank. And uh, we would sit in his garage and he'd tell me, you know, these stories of him smoking crack, and I thought it was hilarious, you know. And we're sitting in his garage drunk one night, and we hear about a storm coming through Denver, Colorado. So, you know, why not? You know, we don't have anything holding us back. We pack his camper up, you know, we drive from Dallas to Denver. It takes about 18 hours. We get there and uh, sleep it off. He's parked at an RV park and uh, there's a bar right down the road. So we go to this little bar and, uh, you know, he makes good money. He likes to be a big shot. You know, I'm not going to call him one of us, but he has a lot of similar traits to a lot of alcoholics I know. So we're in this bar and he's buying grounds for the bar. And, uh, you know, we're all drinking and the bar closes about one. We are tore up and uh, cooler beer in the back. And as we're walking out to his truck, he throws me the keys. He says, uh, I've got like nine DUIs and I'm going to go to prison if I get another one. So I need you to drive us back. So I mean, we're only a mile away. Not a big deal. You know, it's just right down the road. So I get in the truck and uh, I immediately get lost. You know, I haven't been in Denver 24 hours yet. So I'm driving this truck around, tore up. Lost, and I, I remember I, I drove for hours, you know, and I would be deep in the mountains, and then somehow I'd be like downtown, you know, and I'd be going back and forth between, you know, it looked like a western movie to like deep in Denver, you know, metropolitan area. So around 3 a.m., I need gas, so I stop at the gas station, and the truck's filling up, so I go inside to ask the attendant, you know, where should I go? And as soon as I walk in, there's two police officers sitting right next to the counter. I'm a liar. I'm a manipulator. So I know that if I act suspicious, then that's going to be my tell. I'm going to jail. So I march right up to these cops. And uh, like, hey, maybe you guys can help me. I'm staying at this RV park. How do you get there? And I, I do my best to stand very still and breathe very lightly. And uh, they sit there and they give me all these directions. And I'm just waiting for them to stop talking. I'm not listening. And this was 2009, I mean, well before I had GPS on a cell phone. So they stopped talking, and I said, thank you very much. And I, I go out and get in the truck, and I drive away. And uh, it was about three hours after that that I fell asleep driving, and I drifted into oncoming traffic, and I hit a Buick head on. And uh, the first thing that I remember is I'm on the side of a mountain, and I look up, and there's headlights right in front of me. And then this Buick explodes. And uh, everything from the front bumper to the windshield was gone. And, uh, you know, I'm in an F-250 Super Duty, you know. So uh, I will never forget that image. You know, I immediately jump out of the truck. And, of course, you know, I'm drunk and uh, super selfish. You know, I used to think that, like, drinking you know, was my medicine, it made me not selfish, it made me not angry, but it was like putting a band-aid on a broken leg, or just, you know, something to numb it. You know, my leg's still broken, I still misstep, I still can't walk straight, but I just can't feel it anymore. You know, I'm just as selfish drunk as I am sober. So, uh, I dispose of the headlines, and uh, I get out of the truck and I run over to this Buick, and it's a lady in her 50s, there's a car seat in the back, and, uh, she is alive and responsive. Her engine pushed through the firewall and uh, it was sitting right next to her. And it had sprained her wrist and that was the only injury that she had. So the cops showed up and uh, of course they arrested me. They took all of us to the hospital. She was discharged, thank God. You know, because I'd still be in prison today. You know, it was that quick. And when I got my blood drawn and they gave me all this blood analysis and my blood alcohol content at that moment, you know, I've been driving so long, I was only a .08. But it doesn't matter. There are plenty of people sitting in prison right now that are just like me. You know, not any worse people than I am, not any better, just like me. And uh, I am so grateful, you know. But... 
course, I'm arrested. I'm charged with uh, felony vehicular assault and a DUI. That's my first charge. They take that stuff pretty seriously out in Colorado. You know, one DUI is automatically a year sentence. So I got amazingly the minimum. It was my first offense. I was very young, but I was sentenced to a year. And uh, I went into jail. And I spent just a little bit of time in you know, your regular jail situation, but shortly was moved to a work release program. And uh, the work release program worked. You know, you would find a job, and uh, days that you worked, you would leave jail, and uh, you had to call, tell them, you know, I'm leaving work, and your time coming back, all this stuff, but you know, it's just you go to work and you come back to jail every night. So uh, as soon as I get out, I'm finding ways to get messed up. Every single opportunity you give me, and there's no consequence severe enough for me to stop. And I've learned that. Doesn't matter. You know, I had plenty of people tell me my life is on the line. So what? You know, I would rather die messed up than live miserable and sober. One hundred percent. And. Uh, you know, from the very beginning, I'm sneaking ways to get messed up, and uh, I'm getting away with it, and I've got this really good facade that I'm some good kid and just made a stupid mistake, you know, and I, I've convinced these sheriffs that I, I was just a, a mistake-making good old boy. You know, I'm from Mississippi, you know, everyone's from Colorado, a lot of those guys, multiple offenders, all this stuff, and I was just trying to fly under the radar. But uh, I managed to make it through that program somehow. I got... Five years of probation after that, I transferred it back to Mississippi, and I messed up every single day, and uh, somehow I make it through that. You know, I, I got arrested twice on probation, you know, somehow it didn't come back to bite me. You know, honestly, I think my probation officer just really did not care, number one. He was retiring shortly. You know, he never once gave me a drug test. He never once gave me a hard time about anything. I paid my fines. I showed up. That was it. You know, but had I been caught, had anything happened, you know, I've been in prison for five years. You know, and this whole time, my license is suspended for the duration of my probation. So I'm driving with no license, no insurance, messed up most of the time, you know. But, you know, anything that was going to stand in my way of getting messed up or the things that I needed to get messed up, you know, I'm just going to run right over it. So uh, my life... You know, I'm holding it together. I have a place to live, sort of. It's a dingy place that I'm splitting with somebody. You know, I've got a, a crappy job, and it's just enough to get by. And I, I didn't realize how bad my situation was until I eventually got sober and it got better. You know, because I never had stuff. I never had anything to lose. You know, even though I was messed up and I was living in, you know, squalor, that's the best I'd ever had. That was the best I'd ever done. You know, so I really didn't even think much about it. But eventually, you know, it got to this point where I, I, my cell phone kept getting turned off. And I was eating a dollar cheeseburger a day. And I couldn't pay my little, small amount of rent anymore. And uh, I was constantly in jeopardy of going to jail. And things just kept getting worse and worse. And I remember... My grandmother, who's also been sober, and I'll just mention this, my whole family's in the deal. You know, my grandmother's been sober 35 years. My mom's been sober seven now, almost seven. Uh, uncle, you know, he's had some relapses recently, but he had 28, you know. You know, just everyone in my family is part of this deal. So my grandmother offers to let me move in with her on the condition that I would attend AA. I did not have to stop drinking, but I had to go to meetings. And uh, I moved in with her, and I started going to a group down the street, or at least I would tell her that I was going to a group down the street. So I remember the first time I, I tried to get away with that, you know. I, I leave at 6.45, I come back at 8.15, and I'm like, great meeting. And uh, she's like, you weren't at the meeting. It's like, the hell do you mean? And it's like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so was there. They said you weren't. I was like, I don't know much about this. But I know anonymity. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm starting to quote traditions at her. But uh, so, 
you know, the jig was up at that. So I would start going to meetings, and the whole time, it had some magical effect on me. I would sit in these meetings and just made me want to drink beer. And I wasn't even much of a beer drinker, but just sitting around with those people, I just could not stand it. So I would go to the meeting and I would leave and immediately get beer. And that was acceptable under my grandmother's rules. And I will also say that she had a bunch of people in her AA circles telling her that she was enabling me and this was you know, a bad decision on her part. But there was something that eventually happened out of this situation. And, uh, you know, I never thought that I was an alcoholic. You know, I thought an alcoholic was a robot that was just pretty much a zombie on autopilot for drugs and alcohol. And that's just what I imagined. But for me, it was totally different. I wasn't an alcoholic. I just wanted to get fucked up every single day. You know, and I just made that decision consciously every day. I'm going to get messed up. And uh, eventually, I was going to this meeting, and I would be on the way there, and I'd be thinking, it's like, man, I'm going to get so drunk after this. And then I would end up drunk before. And I couldn't even make it to the meeting. You know, and as soon as it started hitting me, and then I, and I, that's the first time I ever tried to stop or control any part of my drinking. I remember I had a sponsor when I first came in. He's like, what happened when you tried to, like, control and enjoy your drinking? Like, I, I never did that. You know, I tried to, like, not drink for one hour for a few weeks, but that was it. You know, I, I never tried to have any sort of control. And uh, I would be driving this meeting, and I would end up drunk before I got there. And then it became very apparent. And uh, my parents had relapsed, but they went through treatment a few months before, and they started showing up to these meetings. So I remember, I walk into this meeting, and my dad is sitting right there, and I am so obliterated. Like, all I can, I can't say anything. It, it's very clear to anyone. I just sit down next to him. You know, I, I don't say anything. And there was just something about it. God had this plan of everything coming together, and it's wild how God's plan is. And, you know, it finally started hitting me. It's like, man, maybe I really do need help. You know, so after that meeting, I decided to go to treatment. And I went to treatment, and as soon as I got there, I had a carton of cigarettes, and someone offered me an exchange, a few packs of cigarettes, and they'll get me messed up. And that was it. And in my mind, it's like, okay, well, one more. And I'll be sober tomorrow. That's fine. No big deal. And I really believed that. You know, and then it was the next day as well. And then it was, well, I'll run out of cigarettes eventually. You know, I'm serious about getting sober. But just tomorrow, not today. And uh, they kicked me out of that facility. And, uh, you know, I, I went back to my grandmother's and I was drunk for two more weeks. And uh, I, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, and I was getting messed up. And I was miserable the whole time. And that had never happened to me before. You know, there was no relief, there was no comfort. And I would continue to get more and more and more, and I just felt worse. And then I'd be blacking out and angry because, you know, my medicine stopped working. And I'm grateful that I got to that point before I died. You know, and then I went, that was August 3rd, 2016. I went to Serenity uh, Recovery Center in Memphis, Tennessee. That was the day that I met Woody. Woody was a big oaf, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure y'all met Woody, and that he was ridiculous. And, you know, they would say this stuff like, maybe one of you is going to make it. And I'm like, suck for y'all. You know, y'all came at the wrong time because that's me, you know? But, you know, Woody could attest to this. I was pissed, you know? And I had really conceded that I had to do this. You know, and it really hit me that I had to make some significant changes in my life, and I was not happy about it. And I was not convinced that it was going to be better. You know, and my counselor was the only person that had any sort of hope to give me. You know, because I like music. You know, like I said, I was a band kid. I'm in a band now. But I like going to concerts, and I just had this image that, like, I would be sober like my parents were sober. And that's all that AA had to offer that I would go to an AA meeting at 5.30 p.m., I would go home, eat a frozen TV dinner, and I would watch Matlock, and then I would go to bed by 9 p.m., and that would be my life forever, or I'd die. 
<laughs> and uh, I didn't want that. But my counselor was able to convince me that not only could I stop drinking, that I could be happy, and I could still live a life that I enjoyed. And that was the first time that it had ever like been described to me that way. And uh, I told myself, I'm going to give this one year. You know, I'm going to come out swinging. I'm going to do what they say to do. And if in one year my life is still terrible, I'll just kill myself. And, uh, you know, I, I started listening to what other people had to say. You know, because my plan was clearly not working. I, I wanted to give it 100% effort. So my counselor, I had a girlfriend at the time who probably one of us, she's been to some meetings, whatever. My original plan was to move in with her when I got out of treatment. And that seemed like a fine idea to me. But uh, my counselor convinced me that a halfway house was probably a better idea. So I listened to them. And then they said, go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And I know that's not in the book anywhere. But, you know, a lot of successful people were telling me to do that. You know, people that had something similar to what I wanted. So I started listening to them. You know, and people can only give you what they have, but they had what I wanted. And uh, they told me to get a sponsor. And my sponsor told me to get a service position, get a home group, you know, start showing up. And uh, I started to read the book, and I started reading all these promises. You know, and they sounded pretty good to me. And they were promised to me. You know? I, I wanted to have these remarkable things that everyone was talking about, you know? A new freedom and a new happiness sounds great. You know, losing fear of today, tomorrow, and the here, hereafter. The fear. You know, and it's so crazy to think about me today. Because when I first started going to meetings, I would hardly be able to introduce myself without my voice quivering. And I couldn't read the card, you know, without about bursting into tears. You know, but I had to walk through these fears. Because they said these are things that I must do. And uh, they assured me that it would get easier, and it absolutely has. I remember the first meeting that I ever chaired, and this might sound messed up to you guys, but uh, it was a speaker meeting. So all I had to do was stand up in the front, read the card, and introduce the speaker. Well, I handed out the readings, and I'm about to have a panic attack. You know, I'm still so full of fear, and everyone's like looking at me, and I'm afraid I'm going to do something stupid, and they'll remember it forever. And uh, this girl... She's an interesting character. She's had lots of uh, situations where she was acting out. Well, she's reading the tradition. She gets to about tradition five, and she pretends to faint. And she falls out in the middle of the meeting space on her face, and she's laying there. And she's done this several times. So no one reacts. <laughs> and we're all just sitting there. And they walk up to this lady, and they just pop the tradition out of her hand, sit down, <laughs> and continue reading. And just leave her face down in the meeting. But after that, I felt fine. <laughs> and God struck this woman down. You know what I'm saying? So I could feel more comfortable sharing my first meeting. And, uh, you know, that's how I like to look at things. You know, because, I mean, I, I really like to, to be under the perspective that nothing happens in God's world by mistake and just look for, you know, what God might have for me in this or for other people. You know, because it doesn't always make sense to me. I don't always understand why things are the way they are. You know, a, a good friend of mine, you know, my home group, we meet Tuesdays and uh, years ago, several years ago, we started going to eat Mexican food on Tuesdays, Taco Tuesday, of course. So for years, we had a waitress and uh, the same one, and we became really good friends with her. Her husband is a problem drinker. She, you know, talks to us about that. But she starts coming to our birthday parties, our AA events. You know, she's not an alcoholic. We give her almost a grand on Christmas. You know, we love this girl. And uh, she recently, her husband had blood clots and was in the hospital for almost two months. And now he's drinking on the blood thinners. It's a really bad situation. And her son went to the doctor, they gave him an MRI, and had emergency brain surgery the very next week, and now he's at St. Jude getting radiation. 
And I don't know what God's plan is. You know, and she's the least deserving person I could imagine to be going through this situation. But, you know, God has shown up for me in so many different ways. It's still part of the plan. I'm thoroughly convinced. And I might not like it. And I might not understand. But when I get in those situations, I just have to make God bigger. You know, like there's more to God and the world than just what happens as us, as humans. You know, and I'm not a religious person, but I'm a firm believer in God. I'm a firm believer through my experience. You know? I was doing electrical work right before I got sober. And I was getting messed up with all those people at work. So I decided to change jobs. And I got a job working for a general contractor just sweeping, really. So I'm sweeping, and they do a lot of hospital work. You know, there's several hospitals in the area that they have jobs on. And uh, I'm sitting at my halfway house in Midtown Memphis, and I get a call from my boss who did not really like me. And he said, how'd your job interview go? And uh, I thought he was being condescending. Like, he thought I was trying to find another job, and he was just trying to catch me or, or whatever it was. But he had actually set me up for a job interview. And I was an hour late. And uh, I, I look at the address. He had set me up. You know, St. Jude had reached out to him. They needed a temporary maintenance worker. So I look at the address, and it is one block over and up from my halfway house. It's a satellite facility from St. Jude. I didn't know it was there. So, you know, I've got this violent felony on my record, the violent, the vehicular assault. I'm living in a halfway house. I've been just obliterated out of my mind for the past 12 years. And I'm like, well, I have to go. They're not going to give me the job. They'll do a background search, throw my application away immediately. I go there. They do a background check. I mean, they give me the full gamut, and they give me a job. And it's absolutely wild how God works. I'm not supposed to be there. And then, you know, it was, a, it was great in so many different ways. You know, and I'm complaining about my newly sober problems, and then I look at a toddler with radiation burns on their skull. You know, and I ask someone how they're doing in a freaking elevator, she says, oh, well, my daughter just died. You know, so it really changes your perspective. And it was really good for my, my emotional nature and my spiritual nature and my perspective to be there. So I was temporary in the maintenance program at this facility, and as soon as my contract is over, it just so happens the contractor I was working for starts a full remodel on that building. Well, I've been working there 18 months. So I knew the building. I knew all the administrators. You know, and of course, I was a shoe in to naturally start supervising this project. So in two years, I went from sweeping the floor to supervising for a general contractor. And it is absolutely wild. And I'm not very good at my job. I'm not super smart. I'm not even that friendly. But <laughs> I do make a sincere effort to apply God's will and principles in my lifestyle. And so many things have happened. It's unreal. You know, and the more I do that, when we stay close to God and perform to work over, remarkable things happen. He provided what we need. And that has been exactly my experience over and over again. And uh, when things get dark, things get uncomfortable, whatever, you know, I have these experiences to look back on. It's like God was so real in that moment, and I might not feel it right now, but I know that's undeniable. It's irrefutable. So, uh, you know, I, we, I supervise that project, and then my uncle starts his own general contracting company. And this is where I meet Nick. So I'm in Memphis, and we're getting a crew together. A hurricane had hit North Carolina, and we're going to start an office in North Carolina doing the repairs. And uh, I meet Nick, and he tells me he's a master roofer, a master carpenter, master plumber, master sheet rocker, you know, all these things. He's just really good at everything. And Nick's a great guy, but uh, <laughs> we get out there, and, uh, you know, the crew quickly falls apart. It is a nightmare. Nick's, you know, sober for a while, and then he's not. And then a lot of the other guys were sober for a minute, and then they weren't. And uh, things were just absolutely out of hand. And uh, I remained sober, but it was the, the worst period of my life, sober or drunk, worse than jail. You know, I remember having a panic attack, you know, just over all the things that were going wrong. And I had all this fear and, you know, I, I was having a really hard time with accepting God's will. But I do remember 
And Nick can tell you the story. That he, I, and one other person, we were in rural North Carolina looking for a meeting. And uh, I get online and I, I look up an AA meeting in this area. And uh, it's like a website from 1995. You know, it's like a, a Comic Sans font. And it's just like these real cheesy neon colors and all this kind of stuff. But it has an address for an AA meeting. So we drive like 30, 45 minutes out of our way to go to this meeting, and it's like podunk nowhere. And uh, it's a house, and there's like 10 cars there. So we figure it's just, you know, a meeting in somebody's house, you know, must be. We get out, and we walk up to the door, and it's not a meeting. It's actually a wake for this man who owned the house. His son had just died of an overdose. And we walk up looking for a meeting, and it's just wild. You know, I am lost. You know, 20 hours from home, have no idea where I am. And just at that moment, you know, we walk up to the situation. And I can't tell you exactly what it did for him. I don't have, like, great closure on what it was. But we could feel God in that moment. We all did. He did. We did. It was just a very spiritual moment. And uh, I got to remember that. Because a lot of the time, I, I'll still feel lost for lack of a better term. I don't know what's happening. I just got to wake up and do the best that I can and think about what God would have me do and try and do it to the best of my ability regardless of how I feel or how I want to live my life. And I have to do that by waking up and reminding myself every day in prayer, reading a meditation book helps a lot, talking to another alcoholic. And I'm super glad that Woody asked me to do this you know, I went through a breakup in October, and uh, it's been like really weird adjusting. And uh, I haven't been feeling super spiritual. You know, I'm still doing my routine, but like it's just weird navigating the new lifestyle, whatever it is. But when someone asks me to speak or whatever it is, you know, I want to be good at AA. So I, I make sure and stay on top of my readings. You know, I've had a book study going, you know, once a week for the past five years. And uh, I make sure and stay on top of those things because I don't want to get up here and look like I, I don't do AA good, you know? <laughs> so, you know, I'm very grateful to be asked to come up here. You know, the job is great. You know, I was working for my uncle's company for a while and it fell apart. And that was my biggest fear. I stressed about that for a really long time. Closed the company, my uncle relapsed, you know, it, it was ugly. But God picked me up immediately again. And uh, I have a, a job with a very well-organized company in Memphis, and they're happy with me. I'm super happy with them. And uh, regardless, that's not where my happiness on a deeper level is based anyway. You know? That stuff's cool, and I do attribute that to God. But the important things are that I wake up happy to be alive, which I did not do before. I wake up hopeful for the future. I am blown away by the lifestyle that I have with the amount of friends that I have, the means and the ability that I have to, to do the things that I want to do. You know, last year, uh, a friend of mine in the rooms, I had a bachelor party in Las Vegas. And we went to Las Vegas and we did all the things that you would do on a bachelor party in Las Vegas except drink or do any sort of drug. We had a really good time, you know, and for the right reasons. I, I've got some pretty wild Vegas stories, sober as a judge. <laughs> you know? And I just didn't think that was possible. You know, I've gone to a ton of really great concerts, you know, and I love that. You know, I'm able to travel to Nashville or Little Rock or just wherever. You know, I've gotten on an airplane and flown to Minnesota for a young people's conference. You know, and that's not a lifestyle that I'm accustomed to, you know. I, I never was able to, I mean, God has given me a lot of means to, to really enjoy myself. And I don't know if y'all keep up with the daily reflections, but I believe it was two days ago. You know, the joys of living are very important to be witnessed, you know. And it's very important for me to enjoy my life. Otherwise, it wouldn't look very attractive to a newcomer. And I do enjoy my life, you know, almost too much sometimes. But, uh, it's just unreal. You know, if I could see my lifestyle now, from when I was one day sober, it would be unbelievable. In no way could I imagine it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not just talking about, you know, physical stuff. Just 
the connections that I have with men. You know, I, I hated other guys. I had no use for them. You know, I didn't need friends. You know, but now, you know, I was talking on the phone on the way here, three different guys, you know, and I, I'm super excited. You know, we've got a big New Year's Eve party tomorrow in Memphis. I don't know if y'all are going to be coming through that way, but uh, my band is playing. Our band has a ridiculous name that I will not tell you from up here. <laughs> but, uh, it's a really good time. And, you know, just to be excited for life, especially at my age. You know, I'm 35 years old. Most people my age... Their friends are busy, they've got their family, if they don't do anything, you know, and I feel like I've gotten, you know, just the bonus round. You know, I lived this messed up life, I did all this other stuff, and now I'm just living every day as one I don't deserve, and it's wilder than my imagination could have comprehended. You know? And uh, it all depends on my perspective. I'm not going to say it's rainbows and butterflies all the time. You know, a lot of the time I'll, I'll get bored in the miracle factory as I've heard before and uh, I'll get unsatisfied with my situation and what really helps me to get out of that is talking to a newcomer and uh, remembering those newcomer problems that I had not that long ago and could have again very easily you know but uh, I'm super grateful that Woody asked me I wish he was here it's nice to meet you guys thanks for having me it's all good.